Mark chapter 16, let me have you look at verses 7 through 14. But go your way, underlying that, but go your way. Always in the Bible, if you begin to read it more and more, it says, I being in the way, he led me. So what is the way? It really is Christianity. When we say that I'm the way, the truth, and the life, it's about Jesus Christ. So I've mentioned before to you that if you have a car, it's parked, and you're trying to turn the wheel, it's almost impossible. But if you push it, then it begins to turn very easy. So I being in a way, God will lead me. When all of a sudden we find that Isaac sent out Eliezer to find a wife, uh, once again for a son, that he found her and came back, and Abraham said, how did you do it? He said, I being in a way, God led me. And that's so important in our life. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter, check that out, and Peter, the guy that cursed him before he died, that he goeth before you into Galilee, and there shall you see him, as he said unto you. So very powerfully, I made you a promise. The Spirit of God's going to come upon you, and you are going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, but you need to be obedient. And then in verse 8, they went out quickly. These other women, this would be Mary Magdalene and the other women, the disciples were hiding, they were afraid, they had threats on their life, but it was the women, you remember, that wrapped him quickly, and they're going back early in the morning on the resurrection day to once again finish the job. They went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were astonished. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. So we saw last week they came up, and they had their spices and everything else. They weren't really sure how they are going to remove this stone. And by the way, that stone was on a 30-degree angle. So when you would build these tombs, you would also build a trough. It'd be a kind of a little trough. And they usually are about 18 inches wide, 12 to 18 inches wide. And they go downhill. And the reason for that is once you roll that big stone, you can't push it back up. No one can break into it because it's at an angle. So they picked up this stone and a massive stone. They covered the tomb. But when the girls got there, they said to themselves, you know, we forgot the most important thing. Who is going to remove this stone? And we said last week, there are obstacles in our life. Things get in the way, and we begin to say, who? And we begin to ask God, how am I going to get over this carnality? Or how am I going to get out of this complacency? And it's the Holy Spirit that's going to do it. And so here, the women, in verse 9, now when Jesus was risen early the first day, the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. You remember she was the worst of them all. Out of whom he cast seven devils. Very interesting to me. The worst often loves the most. The more that you have done damage, the more that God loves you. And I can prove that very simply. Which of the seven churches was the worst? Laodicea. Which of the seven churches did Jesus Christ spend the most time with? Laodicea. And which did he give the greatest promises to? Laodicea. So sometimes when you find God really working in your life for a long time, it's because he really wants to do something big. So he's not going to let go. Sometimes you're like Tavia from, you know, Fiddle on the Roof. God, could you pick on somebody else sometime? Just anybody else but me. And you don't want that. You want God next to you working in you all over your life doesn't make a difference. The worst thing is when things aren't going well. Verse 10, and she went and told them that he had, uh, was with him as they mourned and wept. So the disciples are mourning and weeping. And she goes, verse 11, and when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, oh, they didn't believe. That cracks me up. Hey, he's alive. Why would Mary lie? No, he's not alive. We're praying our hearts out but we don't know what we're praying for. We're praying that he'd come back, but he came back, but we don't believe it. And then verse 12, after that, he appeared in for another form unto the two of them as they walked and went into the country. That would be the Emmaus Road, you remember. Two men gave up, we're going home, we're quit. And as these guys are walking, all of a sudden this guy walks in and says, hey, why are you sad? And they looked at him and said, where have you been? Are you a stranger? Don't you know what happened? Jesus Christ has been crucified. Well, Jesus is standing right there. So they keep walking, and what does God do? 
Does he hit him, smack him? No. He begins to open the Word of God, and he starts in Genesis and goes all the way through the Bible. I wish that was in the Bible. And all of a sudden, he was going to pass their home, and they, beso- they begged him to come in. And I think that's cool. Because if they said nothing, he would have kept on going. And sometimes you really have to have a desire. And all of a sudden, we see that. And so he came in. And the Bible says when he broke the bread, their eyes were open, and they knew it was Christ, and he was gone. And what did they say? What's the great testimony they said? Didn't our hearts burn when he spoke to us? So it's not me speaking to you or you speak in a Bible study or you trying to speak to the kids and you're saying, hey, man, I think I got them that time. <laughs> no, you didn't. But when God speaks to your kids, it's going to burn their heart. And that's what you want. I can show you another scripture where it says, Peter, you are going to deny me. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. And when Peter cursed God, what did Peter say? And he remembered the word of the Lord. In other words, it just burned in him. Let me give you another example. Jeremiah, just thinking these things out loud. Jeremiah is quitting. I'm not going to be a prophet no more. If this is the way you treat your pastors and prophets, forget it. I didn't ask to be beaten and whipped and strapped into this stuff. And all of a sudden, we read, but the Word of God began to burn inside my heart, and I had to preach. So, thy word did I find, I did eat, it was the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. And then they said once again, these two men, so Jesus picks them up. So, here's two guys quitting. Does God quit? No. These guys are going home, it's done. Jesus doesn't want them to go home. Now, let me say it to you very simply. You want to quit, but God doesn't want you to. And you want to just go and do your thing, but God doesn't want that. Well, what's he going to do about it? Well, he's doing it. You're here tonight. He's working in your life. To me, that is a great God. And then also we read here in verse uh, 13, it says, They went and told it unto the residue, neither believe they them. Oh, that's good. Now you have a guy. It was a woman. That's why. No, it has nothing to do with women. They didn't believe. Well, now here are two, in the mouth of two of things established. Oh, they didn't believe. They didn't believe. So what's the greatest danger of our life tonight? Unbelief. What is the one thing that opens every door for us? Believing God. Believe in God with all your heart, with all your soul. And then verse 13, they went and told everyone. Verse 14, afterwards, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat. They went, he walked right through the door. They locked the door, everything else. Hi, guys. How you doing? Oh, man. The hardness of their heart. So here it says, their unbelief, the hardness of their heart, because they believed not them, which had seen after he was risen. So if they could have believed, it would be so much better because it would say they had that gift of faith. But because they had to see Jesus, then believe, it's not the same. It's still good. It's not the same. Thomas says, I don't have to see you. And yes, you do. You said that. Thomas, it would have been better if you would have believed, but you got to see me anyway. And so the question comes, am I living by faith or am I living by feelings? Am I waiting for God to move or do I believe that God's ready to do things right now in and through my life? So this old world, I'll tell you what, it was one dark night. That night of the crucifixion was probably the darkest night of the whole world. It was a horrible time. It was a dark day when God condemned the world on Noah's flood, you remember. And it was a horrible day, the day that God killed his only begotten son. It says in Isaiah, in 53 verse 10, it pleased the Lord to bruise his son. And so there he hung naked. He hung bleeding. He hung between two thieves. Why? Because of my sins and my sins only. So that day was buried in the heart of his disciples. Satan was no doubt rejoicing. And heaven was weeping, and the earth was absolutely ignorant. And then it happened. Pilate probably was having a cup of coffee, and through the streets, he's risen, and Pilate just dropped his coffee. Herod probably was taking a bath, and all of a sudden, he went all the way under. And the guards that watched him unbelievable. They couldn't believe it. He's risen from the dead. The cry goes out. God raised his son from the dead. 
The Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. And all of a sudden, there was a great surprise. And that's Christianity. If you've lost that in your life where you, you don't expect anything anymore, then I feel bad because you have a God that wants to surprise you. Well, what do you mean by that? It means that when all of a sudden God gives you His grace, you don't deserve it. And when all of a sudden you're married to that woman that really has been the greatest thing in your life, you don't deserve her either. But God surprised both of you because He knows what He's doing. And when I look at the surprises of God, it's like, God, this is a great thing you're doing. They want to do another book? As I, was, I was shocked. But praise God. So God's in the business of surprising you. Now, do you believe that? Well, yeah, I do, Pastor. So you come anticipating God healing you. Well, um, I, I say amen kind of softly when the pastor says it. Okay. And, and you believe that, you know, by ministering and reaching out and giving, it's going to come back a hundred times. Well, yeah, 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 kind of. Okay. Are you saying to me that in your Christian walk, you're not very often surprised? No, that's true, Steve. I go to work. I say hi. I get my check. I come home, give it to my wife, and I watch TV, sports, go to bed, come to church, and I get convicted, and so that's it. That's your whole life. You mean your children don't surprise you when they walk? And when your son hasn't been in trouble for a whole year, that's not a surprise? And when your wife hasn't jumped in your face for a month, that's not a surprise? And when you go and ask forgiveness, that's not a surprise? Come on. Is it that bad? Well, then maybe we need to take you behind the barn and just beat you. You know? I mean, are you saying with all your heart that God doesn't surprise people? He did with Rob and Cheryl the other day. God surprised them. And when God does, it's affirmation. It means that God loves you just like you are. And it means that God has great things in your life. It means that all of a sudden, your worship guy goes out and buys a very cheap guitar. He does. No, very inexpensive. This black one right here, very inexpensive and under $500, very inexpensive. But God surprised him because this is one and only of one that had a unique sound to it. And it's worth way more than that. But in the hands of someone who knows how to play it, it could have been bold or warped, or, but it came out absolutely, absolutely incredible because you know Kevin that he would not come with a $300 guitar on stage unless it was absolutely, unbelievably good. Now, he's going to sell it for $500. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I'm just saying that he was surprised. And I'm liking tofu. I'm surprised. So, please... Because you have not faith. What you're doing is you're seeing the heathens are prospering and these guys are doing great things. And look at that. No, turn to, to say where you are. But in Psalm 73, it says, and God dealt with the wicked. You just don't see it. God wants to surprise you in a very powerful way. And that Easter morning, nothing would hold him because death could not hold him. Pilate could not kill him. The grave could not keep him. Stones could not break him, and Satan could not stop him. So you're talking about this God that you serve, that nothing can get in the way. He can pay a dentist bill, and he can also open the heart of a woman or a man, or he can give you a house for free. You have no idea what this God can do. He can separate the light from the darkness. He can do things that would just challenge you beyond recognition. He can even give you a heart to speak a message in a right moment that would change the world for God. But if you're walking around with your head down and your hands in your pocket and you don't think you're ever going to be surprised by God, well, what's going to happen is you're going to run into the back of a car and things are going to go on. But I'm here to tell you, if you're going to do that, God's still going to surprise you because you haven't got run over yet. Because God has a purpose for you. It says here that Easter, look at in Mark chapter uh, 16, verse 9, now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. In other words, to Mary, he's going to go. Four things I want to share with you tonight quickly. Number one, go tell them. I like that, them. Go tell them. 
I am alive in Galilee. We have the notes up here. Go tell them I am alive in Galilee. So there's number one point. In other words, he overcame her fear. Mary was just going through it. Mary Magdalene. If you would, look at 16, chapter 16, verse 7 one more time. But go your way, tell the disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. Who is privileged to have the first message of the resurrection? Mary. Who is privileged to have that responsibility of telling people? Now, it's not her problem because they didn't believe. It was God's honoring her. And because she was demon-filled and she was hassling and she had to be cast out, no doubt there had been those scars in her life. So some reason God picked her and God did a great work in her life. And they went out and she was afraid. So go tell them. Now, God knew that they were not going to come. And God knew that they were going to hide. And God knew that they were pretty pathetic guys. And this is the reason why. Because until they were going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, they were going to live by fear and they were going to live by their carnal means. They needed something else. They didn't have the fire. Oh, they lived with him, but they didn't have him inside. They loved him, but it wasn't the love of God burning in their heart. And they were unwilling to die, but now they'd be willing to die because what happened in their life? Because in Galilee, the Spirit of God's going to come upon them. And it's going to baptize them. And they're going to have boldness, dunamis, dynamic power that nothing's going to stop these disciples. And so Peter stands up and says, you men of Judah, hearken to me. And he beckoned with his hand. You crucified the Son of God, but God raised him from the dead this day. That's incredible preaching. Before rulers and leaders who are going to kill you. They didn't care. In fact, they were beaten And they walked out, they picked up their shirts, and they said, look at the scars on our back. Isn't that cool? Let's go for it again. You couldn't stop them. In other words, these 11 disciples became radically changed, and they now are no longer fighting for a position. Why? Because they're baptized in the Holy Spirit. So now they're on the way to prayer. Remember, John and Peter on the way to prayer. And they see this guy, and he says, give me some money. And Peter says, silver and gold. Have I none, but such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And boy, he was healed, and they went on serving God with all their heart. So they didn't have the money. They didn't need the money. They had the anointing. Now, do we have that? I don't want to pray. And I'm so mad at everybody else. What are we saying? If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there are schisms in the body because of the lack of the Holy Spirit. In fact, A.W. Tozer said it best. If you would take the Holy Spirit out of the church, 90% of the church would continue as though nothing happened. That is the most incredible dikement against the church you could ever want. That's not our church. So when I begin to get carnal, I need the Holy Spirit to open my ears and open my heart And put the Word of God back in because I'm a big boy. I can do that. I know that I'm talking this way because I haven't been looking to Jesus. God, fill me. And what did Paul say? We have leaky vessels. In other words, our vessels leak. So we have to constantly be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And then there's boldness and power and authority. And it's not fear and insecurity, but power. So when the two men of Emmaus Road, when they were touched, they went on for the ministry. When Mary Magdalene was faithful, she was afraid, she got baptized. When Peter and those guys got baptized, they never hid again for the rest of their life. So if I'm so insecure and so afraid and so up and down, maybe Sunday night coming out and being baptized in the Holy Spirit would be the greatest thing in your life because it's not you, it's Him. The life that I now live I live by faith in the Son of God who died for me, and I now live through Him. So I live, I move, I have my being in God. Maybe there's tension in your home. I guarantee you what it is. You got this flesh and this flesh. You both need to die, and the Holy Spirit needs to bring these two and reconcile at the cross of Jesus Christ. Your kid runs away. You hit your knees, and you say, Holy Spirit, go after them. He's like a a dog from heaven going after your kids. Or you pray God sends somebody to them and it happens every single time. And so go, go, t- go tell them. 
He's alive. Secondly, go tell Peter. Look at this in a very powerful way. If you have your Bibles, turn to John 21, verse 3 and 4. John 21, verse 3 and 4. I love this story because here is, I mean, if, it, if I was God, I would get Peter at the very end, wouldn't you? Or maybe you would say, well, I think, you know, everyone should be raptured here, but some of you kind of wait maybe three or four minutes before you go. <laughs> well, why would you do that? Just to be mean and kind of, God doesn't do that. We're all going to go if we're right with him. But notice Peter Look at this. Peter, are you hungry? And John chapter 21, verse 3 and 4, Simon Peter saith to them, now you remember, I'm going fishing. Now what did God say? Go to where? Galilee. So Peter was disobedient with a sword. Peter was disobedient, you remember, going fishing. And Peter was disobedient all the time. After he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, he wasn't disobedient. It goes on to say, we also go with thee. That tells me that Peter was the leader. And they went forth and entered into a ship immediately that night. They caught everything. What did it say? They caught nothing. Now, does that make sense? If you go outside God's will, are you going to catch anything? Tell me. No? Yes? No? Okay, say it with a little bit more authority. No. If you are outside God's will, you're not going to get that job, right? Yes. Okay, I'll help you. If I'm Doing what God wants me to do, nothing is going to stop me from getting what I deserve and what God wants me to have. But everything is going to be hard for the transgressor. So I being in the way, looking at my life like, Peter, I'm going fishing. That's it. That's disobedience. So why should he catch anything? If you're disobedient, why should your marriage get blessed? In other words, how is God going to get your attention? Well, I'm not going to tithe. That's fine, but you're going to be broke. Well, I don't think that's fair. It doesn't make a difference. The Bible says you have holes in your pocket. Why? Because you have robbed God, and he's going to get his money back. Well, how is he going to do that? Well, you wash machine break? Yeah. I, I, I really wanted that $400 for that big, but my the thing broke. Why did it break? And, you know, I mean, you're playing with God like loaded dice. But if you're obedient, then everything goes your way. Look at this, so powerful. He also uh, go with thee. And immediately that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. <laughs> this is so cool. But the disciples knew not it was Jesus. They didn't know. He said unto them, cast thy net on the right side of the ship. And ye shall find that they cast their thereof, and now they're not able to draw it in for the multitude of fish. Therefore, verse 7, that the disciples, when Jesus loved, that be John, saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fishing coat unto him. He had nothing on, he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. Now, does that sound like Peter? It sure does. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this. Jesus, you don't have to go to the cross. Get thee behind me, Satan. Wow, gee. Yo-yo, Peter, back and forth. We're right here. I'm going fishing, okay? Did you catch anything? No. Hey, Peter, I think it's the Lord. Oh, <laughs> over the sight. The guys didn't follow him now. So everything he did was big emotional, reactional. I mean, he's now swimming the sword because he's cursed God. He has a reason for it. And then verse 6, he said unto them, cast thy nets on the right side, you're going to catch it. Verse 7, therefore the disciples whom Jesus saith unto Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fishing coat unto them, for he was naked. I did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship. They're not going to get wet. For they were not far from the land, but as it were 200 cubics, dragging the net with fish. As soon then as they were come to the land, they saw a fire of coals, and there was the fish that was and the bread. And verse 10, Jesus said to them, bring out 
bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up, drew the net to the land full of great fish, 153, for all there were so many. Now, they did not bring the nets. They were having a problem. But Peter by himself pulled that boat in. So that tells me he was pretty buffed. And Jesus said, verse 12, saying to them, come and dine. Now the disciples wasn't really sure what was happening. So was it Jesus mad? No. Did he, did he bust them? Uh-huh. Did he come? Has he come to you at any time in your life and say, have you caught anything? How, how's the fruit looking in your life? How's your relationship doing? How's your prayer life doing? Boy, he puts his finger right on our lives. Did you catch anything? No, but I'm trying. I know. I'm not mad. But, Stephen, Naomi went down to Moab. Why? Because there was a famine in Bethlehem. Doesn't make a difference. She's now out of God's will, and she's in a city and a country that's been cursed by God. So what happens? Her husband dies. Her two sons die. She turns back and begins to go back to Bethlehem, and there's a harvest happening in this land. Very simply. You go this way, you take six steps down. Jonah went down to Tarshish. He's going down to the ship. You turn around, and God will put your feet on the shore and give you the message to go preach. It is so powerful when you realize how good God is. But disobedience and unbelief wipes everything out. But God doesn't want that to be in your life. So what does he do? He stands on the shore and just sees these boys. And guess what? They don't have to say a thing. He knows they are tired, exhausted, and overwhelmed because they've been doing it in the flesh. And that's what happens with our lives. Now we get nasty with our kids. We get nasty with our friends. And we're mad because we're trying to do this Christianity, and we can't do it. Well, you've never brought God into it. You're not listening to God. You're going to do it your way. Yes, it's going to be very, very hard. But if you would stop and ask God to help you, he would sink your boat, and God would use you in a very powerful way. It's so simple. So simple in a very powerful way. Let me give you one more. Go tell the disciples I'm alive. Look at John chapter 20, verse 19. John chapter 20, verse 19. Very powerful story. It says, Then the same day at evening, bring the first day of the week, John chapter 20, verse 19, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. There you have it, afraid. And they came to Jesus and stood in the midst, saying unto them, Peace be unto you. Now, now we wouldn't do that. You chicken guys, what's wrong with you? What was the first message? Kevin and I love this. Peace be unto you. Well, what is going on in their life? They're scared to death. They're going to die. Peace be unto you. What's the first message he says to the world? Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So where do we get this idea that God hates us and God hurts us and God wraps cars around TVs and around poles and God's going to kill your kid because you're not paying attention? God's big enough to deal with you. The problem is, is that... Because you're away from God, you're not making good decisions in your life. And because of that, everything else is falling apart. It's the same thing I've taught you over and over throughout the years. If your relationship with God is this way, you take care of one thing in your life really well, this one thing, that every other relationship, that cross, is going to be absolutely taken care of, and God will make even his enemies be at peace with you. You can never lose. But... If this relationship is off, then this relationship is going to be off, and you're never going to have the marriage. You're never going to have the children. You're never going to have the working relationship because everything is going to be against you because it's just the way it is, because there's no fulfillment in the heart. But when my life is right with God, if I drink of this water, I'm going to thirst again. But if I drink of God, I'm never going to thirst again. So I'm not going to make those mistakes that so many are making because God is going to lead me and guide me. And here the disciples are hiding. God knew that. He wasn't mad at them. And verse 20, and when he had said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad that they saw the Lord. Well, I bet they were. 
because they were goofing off. And then, uh, then said Jesus to them again, Peace be to you, as my Father has sent me, even so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and saith, Receive the Holy Spirit. Pretty cool. And one last one, kind of neat, the one we love so much. Number four, go tell Thomas. Now, go tell them. Go tell Peter. Go tell the disciples. And go tell Thomas. He is overcome. Look at John chapter 20, verse 25. You're right there. The other disciples were therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I see shall see his hand and his prints and put my fingers into the print nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Cop, cop, an attitude. Hey, Thomas, we have seen him. I don't care. I haven't. Thomas, we've, been, we've never lied to each other. I don't care. I want to see. Now, it bummed them out and God knew. So look at verse 26. After eight days, again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the door being shut, stood in the midst and said, Hey, hey, hey peace be unto you. Now, that's a good thing. Because if all of a sudden an angel came into Rob's house, went through the front door, and he's watching TV, I think it'd be nice to say, Hey, Rob, be a good cheer. <laughs> Are you some aliens going to shoot me right now? It's just nice to have kind words spoken. Look at verse 27. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy fingers, behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. Be not faint less, but believing. And then here comes the big spiritual giant before, you know, Steve, before Chuck, before another pastor. Oh, Thomas answered and said unto him, I, Lord, am I God? I don't have to do it. I believe. No, 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 no. Verse 29. Jesus said unto Thomas, Because thou hast seen me, and thou believest, blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe. And Jesus says, He reached and put his hands inside and touched him. And that's a great verse in my life because that's one of the reasons I share. I'm transparent. I'll share, I, I share with you. Sometimes when Gail and I get in the house, oh, I share with you about the prostate cancer. I share with you about things. I'm not afraid. Why? Because if I can have you touch the wounds of my body and I made it, then you can make it. So don't ever be afraid of why am I going through this? Because God's going to use it in your life and you're going to be used by God to help somebody else. So here's what I kind of learned in a very powerful way. What a morning. Just, just a quick morning. The stone was rolled away. They could not find the body, so they're panicking. Then the angel was speaking, and the earth was shaking, and they heard someone say, Be of glad tidings. They remembered his words, and they were moved to testify, and Peter was forgiven all in one day. Pretty good God, isn't he? But really a good insight to human nature. You're going to go crazy. You're going to have to pull it together. You're going to say things you wish you would have never said. You're going to have to get them back somehow. You're going to not have what you think you should have because God knows you shouldn't have it. But because Peter cursed God publicly over a fire, I think the one of the great things I love about God the most is that when Peter was walking afar off, there was a fire, and these people were around it, and Peter is cold. Of course he's cold. You walk away from God, your heart's going to get cold. And he's trying to warm it with this world's fire, and all of a sudden they begin to bust Peter. You sound like one of his disciples. Oh, no, I don't know who the man is. Well, eventually, curse it be the man. I don't know him. And Jesus looked right at Peter. So the last thing on Peter's mind was, I cussed God out over this fire of the world. And I want to tell you in a nutshell, if you are getting your fire and your warmth from this world, then you will curse God every single time. But if you are baptized in the Holy Spirit and the warmth of God is in your heart, then you will not be cursing God. 
And so he said, come here. He didn't set a building on fire. I want to talk to you. He says, come here. Are you hungry? I am. Peter, stand right here over the fire. Don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of it. Are you hungry? I am. Then let's have lunch, breakfast. Now, Peter, do you love me? Yeah, I do. Okay. God, you're asking me if I adopt you? I do, I do, I do. Okay, good. Take another bite, Peter. Peter, do you love me? I do agape you. Then feed my sheep. The third time, it destroyed Peter. Peter, do you phileo me? Do you have just the love like, a, like the, the city, Philadelphia, is brotherly love? Do you ha- and so Jesus comes down. And Peter got angry because he knew what happened. God is agape. God is agape, which means unconditional giving. But Jesus Christ came down to Peter's level. Do you at least phileo me here? And it just bummed Peter out that he had to make God come down to his level instead of him lifting his hands and praising God. Yes, then feed my sheep. And it had to be that way because 11 disciples, 10 disciples plus Peter, they had to stand with Peter, hear him preach, and not criticize him. So you have a God. I just got to tell you, you got a God that will chase you and bring you back in the belly of a well and put you in God's will so it's hard to get out of God's will. You have a God that is willing to forgive you on that cross for no other reason but because you believe. And you have a God that's willing to give you a message to tell the world with absolute boldness because you believe. And you also have a God that when you don't believe and when you're mad and when you're blaming God, he doesn't kill you. He says, can we reason together? Can we talk about this thing? I know you're mad. I know you're upset. But Steve, at the end of eight months, you know, you're going to be so much better off when I get done with you. Not physically, spiritually, that it's going to outcome the physical. I got something for you. Okay? Great. So I testify tonight. I love God. And he's risen from the dead. And he's all-powerful. 